I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education. Uh, you folks all know that here and are probably sick of me reminding you every week, but we do um, live stream our lectures, um, which is what my phone is doing here. So I'm just reminding the folks at home who I am. Um, we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983. And we like to put on a series of lectures each semester, usually between eight and 10 uh, lectures that focus on a theme. This fall semester, we're back here at Fair, Fairhaven and we're talking all about science. I'm really excited about today's lecture because it's our, our first interactive lecture to really see what science looks like in, in action. So let's go ahead and get started. Kim Koska is currently a professor of chemistry at UW-Whitewater and is the academic director for the UW Flexible Option Program at the UW Extended Campus. Kim has served as the interim dean of the UW, uh, excuse me, University of Wisconsin, Rock County, and is a prior chair of the Department of Chemistry at the University of Wisconsin Colleges. She holds an MS and PhD in chemistry from Carnegie Mellon University and a BS in chemistry from the University of Wisconsin River Falls. Kim earned the 1999 Green Chemistry Challenge Award from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Chancellor's Award for University Service, the Women of Distinction Award from the U YWCA of Rock County, and the Excellence in Instruction Award, Award from the University of Wisconsin, Rock County. Kim lives in Janesville, Wisconsin with her husband, son, and daughter. She enjoys traveling, reading, attending live performances, and hiking. Please welcome Professor Kim Koska. Thank you, Carrie. And thanks to all of you for attending today. I'm really excited to actually be doing this topic this week because, you know, we're entering the holiday season with Thanksgiving around the corner. And we're going to be talking about whipped cream and butter. And what's more holiday than whipped cream and butter, right? So, um, so that's what our topic is today. Um, I also, you know, we're going to have some demonstration time. But I also brought a bunch of favorite books. I didn't bring all of them, but just a bunch. So you're welcome to come and flip through them and peruse them. Maybe they're things that you have in your library or wish you did. Um, um, our local libraries have most of these titles, too. So could check those out from your library. So please feel welcome to peruse those resources. So one of the things in my bio that, or that wasn't in my bio, is I also really love cooking and eating. And I think all of us maybe like eating. And how many of you also like cooking? Yeah? So, um, so whipped cream and butter are things that we can easily purchase in the store but we can also easily make them at home. So how many of you have made whipped cream before? What? Made whipped cream from scratch. So a few. Anybody made butter? OK, great. So interesting. So we're going to talk about the science of whipped cream and butter. And one of the major focuses we're going to have is that they're both made from the same thing, right? So they're made from dairy cream. You make them the same way by whipping. So why are they so different? What makes whipped cream and butter so very different from each other? So that's going to be the focus of our presentation today. So let's just start out with thinking a little bit about what dairy is. So we're talking about animal dairy, not like almond milk and soy milk, but animal dairy. So if you go to your dairy case, in Wisconsin, you're going to see two classes of products. You'll see pasteurized products and ultra-high temperature pasteurized products. What you won't find in Wisconsin is any raw milk products because it's against the law in Wisconsin to sell those. So what is pasteurization and ultra-high temperature pasteurization? It's a process by which we hold the milk at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time. And the idea is that you're going to kill off any of the pathogens. So regular pasteurization is just 15 seconds long. And that kills off most of the disease-causing pathogens. Well, all of the disease-causing pathogens. Ultra-high temperature pasteurization, we're going to hold that at a much higher temperature, almost twice as hot 
and we're gonna hold it there for just one to two seconds. What that does is it kills all of the microbes in the milk and renders the milk sterile. So depending on the packaging that you're gonna see come next after that ultra high temperature pasteurization, you could sh store this on a shelf in an airproof container, or you can put it in the dairy case and you'll see those really long um, extended lifetimes on those products. So is one better than the other? Depends, I guess, if you wanted a certain kind of taste. The ultra high temperature pasteurization alters the flavor a bit. And it also will alter the ability of our um, cooking processes for whipped cream and butter. So if you're going to make whipped cream and butter, you should use the regular pasteurized dairy, not the ultra high temperature. If you're buying it for your coffee, eh, it doesn't matter, right? Coffee tastes a lot stronger than any of the dairy products you put in it. All right, so what's in cream? So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. So I just arranged some of the products that you can buy that are made from, um, in this case, cow, cow dairy. So bovine milk. Plain old milk, three to 5% butter fat. Um, have some of you lived in, in a farm where you're milking cows and you're just bringing in your milk from your, from your bulk tank or filtered milk? Yeah. So that milk is three to 5% butter fat and it varies both by the cow's genetics and by the breed of cow. So which are the cows that have the highest butter fat? Guernsey and brown Swiss, yep, the brown cows. And then the lowest is the Holsteins, right? So that varies by breed of cattle. It also varies a little bit by their feed, but more by their genetics. So if we take milk at three to 5% butter fat and produce instead half and half, which is called that because it used to be made by half milk and half cream, that's where the name comes from, that's 10 to 18% butter fat. Light cream, 18 to 30%. You can see we're getting tastier and tastier here, right? Light whipping cream, 30 to 36%, and heavy cream, more than 36%. And it can go up to about 45, even 50% butter cream, or butter fat in, in heavy cream. So how do we do that? Has anyone ever separated cream from milk before? Yeah, how did you do it? Well, apologies. My parents that did it. <laughs> Your parents? Yeah. How did they do it? I think they did it with a cheesecloth. Yeah. Anybody else ever separated cream from milk? They didn't do it, but my grandparents did with a separator. With a separator, yep. Yeah, so maybe it looks something like this. So how do we make cream out of milk? Well. We just separate the cream from the milk. And my grandfather would just do this by putting the milk from the cow on the countertop. And then about eight hours later or the next morning, you'd have a layer, right? Yeah, yeah. So a layer on the top, skim it off with a spoon. That's how he did it. But the lady down the street, um, she had a cream separator. And I thought that was magic, right? You pour the water, or the water, the milk, into this top stainless steel container, crank the handle, and then out of these two spouts, one of them would come skim milk, which we gave to the chickens or the calves, and the other one would come cream, right? So there's a, a cream separator. So that's the old fashioned hand cranked one. And then like a modern one is an electric one. So we still can buy these for household use. So about 60 bucks not even too expensive. So how does that work? Well, what a centrifuge does is, you know, if you take a pail of, of water and you swing it around and around, you know that the water stays in the pail, right? It doesn't fall out. That's a centrifuge. So you're just making a centrifuge to keep water in the pail. The lighter things in the pail, if you had a bunch of stuff in there, would be in the middle, and the heavier stuff goes out to the edge. So in our centrifuge, all of the uh, liquid part of the milk is going to go on the outside edges, and the cream is going to go on the middle. And we have a little hole 
that's here, and it's going to pull out the cream, send it here, and then separate the milk out the other side. So we're using the weight of the cream. You know that it's lighter and floats to the top. We're using that weight to separate those two components out. So, you know, this would be like a household application. If you go to a dairy processing plant, they have special apparatus for this, right? So if we follow the, the trail of the milk, we're going to, oops, sorry. We're going to pipe milk in the bottom. It's going to go up into the centrifuge, and this is a high-speed high mechanical centrifuge. That centrifuge is going to take the heavy stuff, the skim milk, and send it through one tube, take the light stuff, the cream, and send it through another tube. The centrifuge is so efficient that it really almost 100% separates the cream from the milk. So if you want to buy 2% milk, it's actually recombined. So the dairy processor takes some of that fat and remixes it with the skim milk to get the different percentages. So skim is plain skim, and then if you want to have 1%, 2% milk, you're going to recombine the fat. Okay? But we can also take that cream and do other stuff with it, like, like make whipped cream and, and butter. So those are uh, the, the applications we see in industry. So what's in that stuff? If you pull up, and we'll look at some cream later, if you pull up a, a glass of cream or milk, what's in there? Well, there's a lot of stuff in milk. The two compounds that we're going to focus most on are water and fats. There's also a lot of protein in milk, sugars, um, dissolved salts like calcium and magnesium, a little bit of sodium, potassium. But we're going to focus on these two components. So water is the bulk of milk and the bulk of cream. So if we look at a water molecule, it's H2O. You know that from way back, right? So what does that look like? It looks kind of like a Mickey Mouse head. right? We've got oxygen, which is red in this image, and then two white hydrogen atoms. So that's most of it. The other part is fats. And what I'm showing with this model of this um, molecule is called a triglyceride. And what I want you to see here is that that molecule also has oxygen. And we use the same color coding, red. So anytime you see red here, that represents an oxygen atom. We use the same color coding for hydrogen, so white. And water is the same as white on this fat molecule. The black spots here, oh, oops, find my. Oh, there it is. I'm just too fast with this thing. I shoot it out of my own eyes. So um, these black spots here between that are holding on to all those hydrogens are carbon atoms. So we can see that as a molecule, those fats are much, much bigger than water molecules, right? So many more atoms. So water weighs 18 units, and this particular fat weighs 855 units. So it's a much, much bigger molecule, so 20, 30 times bigger. So that's what we're going to be focusing on. And we're going to look a little bit more at the fats, because it turns out that the fats are the things that do the magic to make cream into whipped cream and butter. Um, before we go to look more at fats, so one thing I wanted to mention, and there's a little arrow here to remind me, is that when we're looking at the future images, it's important to know that those white hydrogen atoms are really attracted to those red oxygen atoms. So super attracted. We actually have a special name for that. It's called a hydrogen bond. And it's responsible for actually the geometry that you have right now sitting in your chairs. Your shape is due to hydrogen bonds, those attractions between molecules in your body. So. Our two main forms of dairy fat are the one that I just showed you, the triglycerides. So triglycerides, you can probably think about the language there and figure out what that means, right? Tri is three, it's like a tricycle or a triangle. So these molecules have a top 
that's called the glyceride, and then three legs. So that's important. The other component of dairy fat, which is really abundant, is this other group of fats called phospholipids. Lipid means fat, just another name for fat, science-y term. And then it has this little group here with lots of oxygen and this yellow phosphorus atom. So these molecules are super important for making things stick together, especially unlike things. So if you think about our water and our oil, I have a soda bottle here that has water in the bottom and oil on the top, because oil is less dense. No matter how much I shake this, what's going to happen? It's going to separate, right? So we know that, and yet our Milk is composed of mostly fat and mostly water. So how the heck does that work? How is it not separated out? When you buy cream at the store, it comes as a nice homogeneous mixture. You pour out the top of the cream, it's the same as the bottom of the container. So what's happening that I can't do that in my soda bottle here, but milk does that and cream does that. How do they suspend all that fat in the water so that you don't get this muddy separated mix. Well, we're going to take a look at the tricks that um, dairy fat has that we don't have in a bottle of oil and water. So there's a lot going on in the slide, so I'll walk you through it. What we've got here is a peak inside. Whoops, I'm super fast with this clicker. We have a peak inside of a group of these fatty acids and a group of the phospholipids. They make kind of a nest with each other, form this extended network. And what they do is they put all of those carbon tails inside next to each other. And they put all of their oxygen atoms, what we call a head group, on the outside. The reason they do that is as soon as water molecules come along, the water molecules, remember how we said the hydrogen likes the oxygen? So like this hydrogen can see only oxygens here. This water molecule, these hydrogens can only see oxygen molecules here. So water arranges itself around this whole globule and the globule now is disguised as being totally suspendable in, in water. So if I wanted to do that with this oil, I would have to add a molecule that could do this kind of arrangement. So I would probably add mustard. The reason I would add mustard is mustard contains lots of these compounds that can do this kind of arrangement. And it turns out that milk and, and cream have lots of these molecules too. Phospholipids are one of them, and they're called emulsifiers. So mustard is a good emulsifier, cream is a good emulsifier, mushrooms are actually good emulsifiers. So they can help these parts that are oily combine with parts that are watery. So we will set up actually an extended network of water molecules through space, all surrounding those globules. So yeah, you've got a university professor in front of you telling you about these fat globules, but how do we know this? Like, what's my evidence that this is true, right? So scientists have to explain their evidence. Well, it turns out we can actually see these. Now, we can't see them under a microscope because they're just too tiny. But if we look at cream underneath a, an electron microscope, we can start to see these structures. So here's a really cool photo of an electron, what's called an electron micrograph. <clears throat> you see these big yellow features? Those are our fat globules. And uh, shout out to... Miloslav Kolob at the University of Gulf for putting together these lovely images and publishing them so that we could all see and enjoy them. So the fat globules are yellow. <clears throat> and in this particular micrograph, these, whoops. Carrie, I think we needed to do more training with me on the clicker, but I'm getting there. Um, these um, uh, dark purple spots are casein. Um, globules. So casein is a protein that's present in milk and cream. So that's what those are. So these are very, very tiny. 
um, 0.1 to 10 microns. Uh, a human hair is 60 microns wide. So this is 10, six, 10, 10 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And we can see those pretty easily. All right, so let's get to the, the yummy part. How do we make whipped cream out of cream? Well, it turns out that what we're going to do is take advantage of those shapes, those globules, and manipulate them. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to take a, a couple of cartoons here. Um, we start out with our globule. So imagine that I'm just showing you a piece of the globule right here, right? All of our little red oxygens here, all the little tails here. Um, we've got other fats. These are the triglycerides. And they're all combined together in this big globule. And that's suspended in water. So here are some water molecule cartoons. What I'm going to do is take a whisk or a beater, and I'm going to chop through those globules. The whisk and the beater have tiny little air atoms attached to them and, and little bubbles of air. And we're going to pop those through that globule and break it apart. So here's me bringing in my air bubble attached to a beater or a whisk. And I'm going to shove that through that, that membrane that's formed here in the cream. So now what I've done is chopped that apart. So I've got all kinds of little pieces of this network of that shell. That, those pieces are going to combine because they're frantic. Oh, no, we're in water. That is not good. We have to do something to make our environment more favorable to us because water is kind of a hostile environment for all of those little carbon chains. So they find each other and arrange themselves around air. So we make, instead of just fat in the middle, we've got air now in the middle of that bubble. So the same kind of thing happens. We form a globule, but it's now surrounding air instead of surrounding fat. So we also want to, while we're doing this, keep that cold. The reason we want to keep it cold is that we want to keep the energy of these globules low. The higher the, the temperature, the more energy they have, and the more they're going to start to scatter. So if we can keep that solution cold while we're making whipped cream and butter, we're going to have a faster conversion from liquid to our product. So once we form our region around one bubble, we can form a region around another bubble, and we can get this extended network of air surrounded by fat. It's also surrounded a little bit by protein, too, so that also helps. And if we add sugar, that also helps. So we can add a few things to stabilize the, those bubbles. So it turns out that we can get those bubbles only a certain number, a certain largeness, right, at only a certain diameter. After a while, we can make that bubble as big as it gets, and there's a limit to that. And the limit is defined by how much fat's in there, how many bubbles we can form. So how we form bigger and bigger bubbles to get that fluffier and fluffier whipped cream is this process. It's a physical process. It's just physics now called Ostwald ripening. Little bubbles, like these ones, find big bubbles and they coalesce to make even bigger bubbles. Again, that will happen up until we hit a certain limit. Now, if you've made whipped cream before, not the stuff from the store, but homemade whipped cream, you know that it lasts about eight hours, right, before it starts to weep and start to lose some of its liquid and collapse a little bit. If you want it to not weep and collapse, you can add a little bit of gelatin to the mixture, and that will help to stabilize those bubbles. But, you know, if you're not paying attention, you know, listening to the music or telling your kids to do stuff while you're whipping your whipped cream, you can go past whipped cream and start to collapse those bubbles by over whipping. So what happens then is the same thing we did before by bringing in the air to the mixture, we can bring in too much air, it causes the bubbles to pop, and then we lose that volume. It still tastes good, though. <laughs> if you over whip a little bit, it still tastes good, somewhere between butter and cream. Oh, and uh, the limit is for every cup of, of whipping cream that you start with, you can get to about two and a quarter cups of whipped cream. 
After that, it's going to start to collapse. All right, so we've got this network, and if we keep whipping it, we're again going to start chopping those little, what, these, these structures, these globules have a name, they're called micelles. We're going to start to chop those micelles into pieces, and there's not enough structure now, so they just start to fall apart and make layers, which, if you get it cold enough, turns into a nice solid stick of butter. So in that process, what we've done is taken our nice um, fat globules suspended in water and started to chop them up. So we have mostly fat and then just a little bit of water. So that's called a fat in water mixture that we converted or inverted into a water in fat mixture. So if you keep whipping, you're going to get butter, but you're also going to get a lot of liquid. So that's called buttermilk, or some people call that whey. So that's what's left over. You know, that's still good. You can use it for stuff. It's still tasty and actually has a lot of nutrients in it. So, you know, put it in your next batch of mashed potatoes or something. It's terrific. So it's still useful stuff. So how did the cream change from when we started with cream and go all the way to... Um, say butter. So um, our heavy cream is 36 to 45 percent fat, and then we get to butter and we're 80 to 86 percent fat. So that's because we lost so much water from the process of making the butter from the cream. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do our demonstration. And how are we doing on time? Looks good? Okay, good. So I need to do a little setting up. Uh, the reason we're setting up a little bit is because I had to try to keep everything cold, right? That's the rule, to try to make a nice, strong network of fat around air. So everything's in a bin with ice. So I kept it nice and cold. I'm going to make a sweet whipped cream, so I'm going to add a little bit of powdered sugar here. You, yeah, I put it in first. It turns out it doesn't matter to put it in first or last. You know, food, food scientists do all these experiments, and my students do them too. They propose all kinds of crazy experiments. I have a student proposing to make meringues with egg yolks. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> oh. I didn't have the heart to tell them. <laughs> How much what? How much difference would that be if you used just a whip rather than a... Um, you know, for a whole quart, it would take me quite a while. But you get actually bigger, um, fluffier whipped cream if you do it by hand than if you do it with a mixer. I already have bubbles forming. I brought some paper towels.
have a nice, even, fluffy mix right now, but it's not at peaks yet, so we'll go a little longer. It's starting now to make shapes on the top when I pull up the beaters, so I know I'm close to peaks. And also, it stops spattering as much. for a countdown. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Yep, so now we've got our whipped cream. I'm going to whip it a little bit more so it's easier to spoon. Of a, you know, I'm used to doing this with my uh, stand mixer, so it's a lot more effective. So I'm going to put this over here, and while I'm beating the next batch of cream for butter, you're welcome to come up and try some. While you enjoy that, I'll make a batch of butter. Now, butter's going to take longer? Not much, a little bit. When they used to do it, the old butter cream, you know, it'd be up and down, is that the same? Did that take longer then? It probably took longer because the butter wasn't probably as cold, or the, the cream probably wasn't as cold. Yeah, right. And it was usually the unmotivated who got stuck with that task. Yeah. Yep. You could also use buffalo, camel. Uh, actually, I think camel milk doesn't have enough fat. <laughs> yeah, you need to have a lot of butter fat. Is it delicious? Is it good? Pardon? Next time, we can do one on chocolate. That would be fun. Yep. You know, if, if you want to use a whisk for this, um, to cleave more air in, you just can use two whisks at a time. Just tape them together, and that'll go twice as fast. This, this cream is really good. It's not breaking very fast. Well, it's still going to taste like butter. But I'm looking at the time. This is not sweetened. I could add salt if I wanted to, to make a salted butter. <laughs> it is easier to 
go to the store buy. But it actually tastes really good. And um, have you ever had butter from uh, like European style butters? No. European butters? No. They're, they're usually higher fat, but they also have um, been cultured. So they're actually treated with enzymes to, to sort of almost ferment them. So that's culturing. And so they have a really special taste. So it's, they're not actually that easy to find in Wisconsin because until recently it was illegal to sell them in Wisconsin. Wisconsin's very good at protecting its dairy industry. <laughs> I should have let this one get, get warm. Would have broken faster. So you know what Julia Childs does? If you're, because you know there was like this kind of fat phobia for a while. She said, you know, if you're afraid of butter, try cream. <laughs> oh yeah, here comes our butter. Pardon? How do they do this commercially? Automatic whisk? Oh, they have great big blenders. Yeah, That's giant. Really lift without mm -hmm. a Yep. And they would probably also optimize the temperature to go from whipped to flat butter. So this is this actually, I think what we have here is probably now whipped butter. It almost tastes like whipped butter now. Yeah. Well, it's a little creamy yet. There's too much protein. Oh no, that's butter. So you're gonna, it'll taste like butter. It's still not weeping yet though. This is really good cream. I have a feeling this is probably too like fresh. Too, fresh. too fresh. Well, it's probably also <coughs> Like um, really nice, I had kept it really cold, almost frozen, so that oh, helps too. Yeah. So I brought crackers. Yeah, and you can check out the book.